Now we're going to talk about energy and to – I've been promising you for some time that, uh, that there are more forms of potential energy than just the gravitational potential energy. You remember MGH. As you raise an object further and further from the Earth's surface, it has more and more potential energy. Um, with the mass oscillating on the end of a spring, either horizontally or vertically, there's some energy stored in that stretched or compressed spring. And we're going to be able to use conservation of energy to solve these kinds of problems. Very powerful. So uh, springs store energy and do work, like a closer on a screen door or on any kind of a door. There's a spring in there. Uh, it has some energy and it does work on the door, pulls it closed. The elastic potential energy, so you can think of this as, as analogous to the gravitational potential energy, but I've replaced the word gravitational with elastic, which just means springs. Or elastic band, same kind of thing. You can store uh, energy in an elastic band as well. So in an ideal spring is one half this elastic potential energy is one-half times K, spring constant, times X, the displacement, squared. So if we start um, – if we start with some initial large amount of stretch and then we, we allow it to come back, then we have actually decreased the amount of energy stored. This energy stored in the, the potential energy stored in the spring is proportional to X, so that when we're at the equilibrium position here, there's no energy stored in the spring. Um, and so the larger the amount of stretch, the more the energy stored is. And this spring force is a conservative force. Um, otherwise, we would have would not have been able to to write down a potential energy. So, how many conservative forces do we now have in this world? And you say, well, there's gravity, and uh, there's the spring force, and that's all. That's all we've talked about so far. There's two conservative forces. Which one of the following statements? Concerning the elastic potential energy of a ball attached to a spring is true when the ball is moving in simple harmonic motion. The elastic potential energy is at its minimum when the spring is in its equilibrium position. Well, that's not true because in its equilibrium position, x equals 0 and 1 half k x squared is also 0. So it's – oh, actually that is true. It says minimum. So we're going to get the minimum possible, which turns out to be zero when the spring is in its equilibrium position. So that is true. The elastic potential energy is smaller when the ball is at minus x and when is it plus x. This is a really good question because it points out that it doesn't matter which direction you're, you're moving the spring. So if this is the equilibrium position, you stretch it to 1 half kx squared. So let's say you stretch it 3 centimeters this way. So x is 3 centimeters. 1 half kx squared is whatever it turns out to be when you square 3 and multiply by k, divide by 2. Uh, if instead you compress the spring, and so the displacement is a negative 3 centimeters, then what happens then? Well, you put in the negative 3 centimeters in for x, but, it, but when you square that negative 3, you still get 9. So you still get a positive amount of potential energy. So it has the same amount of energy by compressing it 3 centimeters as it does by uh, stretching it by 3 centimeters. So, so that's not true. The elastic potential energy is at its maximum when the velocity of the ball is, at, is a maximum. Well. The velocity is, the, is at a maximum when it passes that equilibrium position. So um, 
and the elastic potential, and that's x equals zero, and the elastic potential energy at that spot is zero because it's one half kx squared. So that can't possibly be true either. The elastic potential energy is at its mi minimum when the ball, when the acceleration of the ball is at a maximum. Well, where is the ball accelerating? Uh, it's moving back and forth between these two positions. Um, it gets to here and it's accelerating a lot. Over here it's accelerating a lot. And, but here we're saying that the potential energy is at a minimum when the ball, when the acceleration is the maximum. But that's not true. The, um, the, ma the potential energy would actually be at its maximum then because the acceleration of the ball is greatest when the displacement of the ball is the greatest. And Okay. Uh, here's a non-trivial example. A 0.2 kilogram ball is attached to a vertical spring with spring constant 28 newtons per meter. When released from rest, how far does the ball fall before being brought to a momentary stop by the spring? So here's our unstrained spring. This is the equilibrium position. And it is released from rest. How far does the ball fall before being brought to a momentary stop by the spring? Now what's actually going to happen here? If you take uh, a spring, you attach it to a, a solid surface, the ceiling or whatever, let it just dangle, then it comes down to here, then you attach a mass to it, and it comes down a little, uh, well, you attach, you attach a mass to it, and then you release that from rest. So what it'll do is that, since it's not stretched or compressed initially, um, gravity will win out and it will start to accelerate, and it'll go down, and then as the string, as the spring stretches, the uh, gravity, um, the, the spring will exert a force upward on the mass. Gravity's pulling it downward, but that upward force gets greater and greater and greater the more that you stretch it. And so sooner or later, the, the mass is going to stop. And that's what we're talking about. Um, between this point and this point, what happens? What happens later is that then um, it reaches a momentary stop, then it starts coming back up again, and then it'll oscillate back and forth. But we're just talking about when you take that spring, attach a mass to it, release it, and then when it comes down to the first time that it reaches that minimum position. So we can actually use, since the spring force is a conservative force, we can use the conservation of energy, and it'll save us a lot of grief. The total mechanical energy, initial, is equal to the final total mechanical energy. And now we get to add um, some more, uh, another term into the total mechanical energy. We've got translational kinetic energy. We've got rotational kinetic energy that we talked about in the last couple chapters. We've got gravitational potential energy. And we have spring potential energy, uh, both initially and then those same terms finally. So the way to solve the problem is just to figure out what, what all the variables are at the initial point and at the final point. Now note that at the initial point, it's at rest. And at the final point, it's also at rest. That's what makes this problem kind of cute because the, um, the initial and the final velocities are zero and the initial kinetic energies are, and final kinetic energies are going to be zero. So the initial velocity is zero, therefore the initial kinetic energy is zero. The final velocity is zero, therefore the final kinetic energy is zero. It's not rotating, so we don't have any uh, rotational uh, kinetic energy. Uh, we do have some gravitational potential energy. And we're going to take this uh, final position as uh, we're going to be measuring heights, assuming that the final position is a zero height. The initial position is H naught. So 
we'll get the mass times g times h naught initially. That's that term right there. And then what about the spring potential energy at this initial spot? Well, the, string, the spring is unstrained. It's not stretched, it's not compressed. And so the um, x, the displacement of this from equilibrium, is going to be zero. So this term doesn't give us anything either. So all we get on the left-hand side is mgh. On the right-hand side, the final position, that's this position right here, is reached when h equals zero. So that's going to give us zero as well because we decided, we defined h equals zero to be that final position. But we do have some one-half kx squared here. That's one-half times k times the amount by which this guy is being stretched squared. So we're replacing x with h naught. And lo and behold, we can now solve for h naught. Notice here that we've got an h naught squared on the right side and an h naught on the left side, so that this one kills one of those. And we can solve for h naught by multiplying both sides by 2 and dividing both sides by k. So we'll get h naught is 2mg divided by k. That's that equation right there. Plug the numbers in, and that tells you how far that'll stretch. So my question for you, a lot of students have um, questions about this part. Didn't, didn't we need to actually find the place where it reaches a maximum velocity first, and then set the initial energy here to the place where it's maximum velocity, and then go from there to the last step. The answer is you can set, since energy is conserved, any two points between here and here, the energies, any of the points, all the points along there, the energy is going to be the same the whole way. It's kind of like that example we talked about with, uh, it was a sled coming down a hill. And, and when it starts at the top of the hill, it has a lot of potential energy, but no kinetic energy. And then as it gets to the bottom of the hill, it has a lot of kinetic energy, but no potential energy. And both at the beginning, at the end, and every point in between, the energy is always the same. It's conserved. So you can set uh, your initial point and your final point to be whatever points are most convenient for you to do the calculation.